Hello, welcome to another episode of the Sojus Sustainability Happy Hour. I'm one of your co-hosts, Pat Keys, the lead scientist at Sojus, and this is my co-host. My name is Mike Bennett. I'm the communications specialist at Sojus, which stands for the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. Every time we have to reintroduce it, I feel like, I, I mean, it's necessary, right? It is very necessary, yeah. It's, it's necessary. Um, Sojus is at Colorado State University, and as you know, probably wherever you are right now, uh, that everything is virtual for the most part, or a lot of things are virtual. And so this effort to do this sort of live stream broadcast, uh, the Sustainability Happy Hour, is sort of one of our things that we're trying to do at Sojus to stay connected in this weird kind of hybrid virtual space. Yeah. Well, happy Friday, and Pat. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Gosh, it actually, like this week in particular, and I don't know why, but it really feels like Friday. Hmm. You know, like some weeks it's like, it's Friday. It wasn't that bad, big of a week. And I don't know what it was, but this week, oof, it feels like a Friday today. So it's good, right? It is good. It's real Kick good. Kick back, hang out, talk about sustainability. Heck yeah. This is the time. <laughs> well, should we start with some fun facts? That's how we always start our shows, with a fun fact about each of us. And... Yes, I, I've, I actually came prepared this week. I, I rarely do, and I thought ahead. And had, I didn't plan this thing to be the, my fun fact on the sustainability happy hour, but it it remains a fun fact. Should I go first? You should go first, because I still- I'm not to trying to like brag about how my fun fact is- Oh, I'm sure it's going to be real fun. It's going to be the fun. It's pretty good. End. I'm just saying it's pretty good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show, I reared with my son some monarch butterflies. And so we raised these from little tiny larvae. And this is kind of like a gross picture, but it's biology. So this is actually the um, all, like the last day so that we raised them from these little tiny, like smaller than like a digit on my pinky finger of these little larvae. And then they became these huge caterpillars. I mean, they were almost the length of my pinky finger by the end of it. I couldn't believe how big they got. And then after about whatever, two weeks of, you know, growing, uh, or more, they they climbed up to the top of their little enclosure and made these little cocoons. And then they were in there, or cr chrysalis, chrysalis. Yeah. Um, Got to get our terms correct. Mm -hmm. And they were in there for another, you know, um, like I can't, I can't even remember, 10 to 14 days. And then on the very last day, the last two days, uh, but the very last day it gets this transparent. And that's how you know they're going to be coming out. And so when this happened, I was just like, I was a totally nervous parent. So I couldn't, I couldn't believe, I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. What do I do? So the person who helped me out with this is a friend of mine, a uh, retired biology teacher from Rocky, Mountain, uh, from Rocky Mountain High School. And she was like, I'll be right over. So she came over and helped me and my son Cormac um, figure out what to do with these. So after they'd come out of their chrysalis and sort of fl flapped their wings a bit, um, my friend helped. And so let's see if I can just do this. So she took them out and she actually brought little tags uh, these little tiny stickers that um, go on the cell of one of these butterflies. And so uh, here she is holding the, the monarch butterfly. And I, I was like, I can't believe you can hold a butterfly and not like kill it, but that's what she does. You can yeah. actually, exactly. So you can hold it by its uh, the strong part of their wing. And then there it is. Um, and so you can actually see, see that now it's tagged. And so if it manages to make it from here to where they're going to go try and overwinter in Mexico, um, either along the way or in their wintering grounds, they might actually be able to collect this one and get a sense of where it came from. Is that just so, like a sticker? It looks like the sticker. It's a sticker. And in my an mind, apple. I'm like, how in the world is it going to fly? But apparently this is a thing and this is how oh. they get tagged. And this is an important part of sort of monarch rehabilitation. And you can, you'll be happy to note this is Piggy and Gerald, uh, named by my son. Um, Very nice. And, and we released them and they fluttered away through our backyard and hopefully they are halfway to Mexico by now. Um, but that's my fun fact. We, I, I reared some monarchs and next year I'm like, I really, I want to get like 20 of them. Cause this was, it was so cool. It was so fun to watch the whole process. You can have like um, a whole flock of monarchs. Is that for what real? Called? And so, and I think I'm so amped about it. I'm going to get, we'll get the link and I'll post it in the notes so that if you want to participate in monarch <laughs> rearing, you can do it too. Uh, I just can't promise that I will have a retired biology teacher living proximal to you to rescue you when you don't know what the <laughs> heck you're doing. Um, okay, that's my fun fact. Nice. Uh, my fun fact is 
let's see, what is my fun fact going to be? My fun fact is that starting this weekend, I think I'm still solidifying some plans. I'm going to be cat sitting and house sitting, and I'm very excited. Oh. Uh, but it is kind of pertinent to what we're going to talk about today because the house is um, like if you drive up to go to like the Horsetooth Trailhead, and then yeah. you kind of keep going up into the foothills a little bit that way. It's this house tucked up there. Like and in Masonville or something like that? I don't really know where Masonville yeah, is. Yeah, okay. No. Anyways, um, it's close enough to the Cameron Peak Fire that the person I'm house sitting for is like, you need to download the, it's like the reverse 911 app where they will text you, Whoa. for example, like when you need to leave. And I've been instructed to just get the cat and go. Uh, wow. So I'm excited. I'm going to treat it like a little Airbnb getaway because I'm just going to be up there by myself. With Maybe a little bit more Lucy. exciting than the, the typical Airbnb. It's true. So we'll see. I'll keep you updated. But the cat's yeah. name is Lucy and she is very cute. How long is the is it going to be for? Like 10 days. Okay. So then it probably won't overlap with the next show because then we would be like live streaming from... Mm. Yeah, no, I don't think it'll overlap that Okay, much. it might not overlap. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is exciting. Yeah. Well, okay, we well we've got things up a little bit today because oh. Pat has some news stories for us. I have some news stories. Typically, I am not the news correspondent, uh, <laughs> but that is that is my job today. Uh, and before we get oh, any further, just so oh, yeah. you know what's coming at you, we are, our guest today, we're going to bring on here in a few minutes, is Kit O'Connor, um, Dr. Kit O'Connor. I believe from the from the Forest Service, and he's among many things been working on actually the Cameron Peak Fire here in Colorado in terms of thinking about management and forest practices. And we're going to talk with him in a few minutes. And so to sort of prime the pump, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, bring on a few news articles that have come up over the last few weeks um, about the fires in the West this season. And some of them put them into context. Some of them take a big kind of overarching view about. Um, the, all the fires throughout the West, some of them look at the transport of um, the smoke, et cetera. So without further ado, let me try and bring these on. Hold on a second. Uh, there we go. Let's see if that did it. All right. So this first article comes at us from Yale uh, Environment 360. And so this is an article entitled The Age of Megafires, The World Hits a Climate Tipping Point. So what this article is really talking about um, is thinking about and reflecting on the science that has recently come out about um, the changes, uh, climate change, and how that's affecting the frequency, the severity, and uh, kind of the overlap of forest fires, not just in the Western United States, but focusing on the Western United States, but looking at fires that are occurring in uh, the Arctic, uh, throughout the Pan-Arctic region, looking at fires in Australia, et cetera. And one of the things that it really tries to emphasize further down uh, in the article is thinking about uh, the frequency of fires, the number of fires, the extent of fires, uh, and how that is just increasing across the board. Also, phenomena that haven't been observed in the past are now becoming, um, I don't want to say common, but more observed, such as actual fire tornadoes. So the, uh, the fires themselves are changing the local weather and uh, inducing climate uh, conditions such that tornadoes form. Um, and I'm not fire. sure, say what? Tornadoes made of fire. I think they're made of more than fire, but I but think uh, there's fire involved. part of it, exactly. And so actually wow. there was a, I believe in California this year, there was actually a fire tornado warning that got issued uh, to people. Um, hmm. I can't remember exactly where it was. Oh wait, there it is. Uh, this year, the, for the first time, the National Weather Service issued a fire tornado warning for California. Wow. Um, yeah, and so, and, and so it talks about that. It also talks about other phenomena that are um, related to climate change. So. One of the things about climate change is some of the wetter places, some of the stormier places in the world are likely to get stormier. This has to do with how much moisture the atmosphere can actually hold. Uh, it has to do with something called the clausius clapeyron law. Um, but over time, so if, if, um, if the physical kind of atmosphere can hold more moisture, storms can become more intense. That actually has a connection with lightning and lightning ignition and how frequently we might see lightning ignited fires. Um, and, so, and so that's another aspect of sort of our changing climate, not just related to uh, forests themselves, but other aspects of our climate system that are changing and how that can connect to the ignition of fires. Um, and then finally, one of the other, uh, let me see if I see it down here. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting that this article highlights is how 
uh, communities, uh, com communities, regions share resources. So across the Western United States, uh, depending on where fires are occurring, different states might try and help share resources with one another. And something that this article points out is that uh, some places were stretched so thin that international resources were mobilized. And this isn't unprecedented. There are other years where this has happened. Uh, and I think during this year, um, countries for, or firefighters from Mexico and uh, Australia actually were helping out uh, the effort in the Western United States um, hmm. during the season. So really interesting article. We'll have it posted in our show notes. Uh, the next article I pulled up, and this is actually just sort of like compared to that one, this sort of feels like, I don't know. I know it's BBC. Sorry, BBC. It just feels like kind of a, a cobbled <laughs> together post of just maps and other things they harvested. But nonetheless, it's still informative. Whereas the previous article focused more on sort of like, these are the fires happening. These are the conditions around these fires to fight them, to manage them. Uh, this is more sort of, well, where's all the smoke going? And mm. so this, there are some maps here of think, looking at the smoke spread, the plumes that were spreading all over North America. And in case, some cases, traveling even further than that. Um, and sometimes it's hard to put things into context about, you know, how widespread damage is or how widespread some of these, um, uh, some of the burn areas are. And so this uh, actually has some, um, so like how big are the fires? So, so for people living in the UK, this is London on this, on this uh, map here, um, to give a sense that this is the spatial extent of some of these fires, hmm. because it's hard to wrap your, it's like, it's the size of Delaware. And somebody in the UK is like, well, what's Delaware? Mm -hmm. And so, so I, some of these, I, I really like it when they include these. So like, you've got a comparison for India, for New Delhi, uh, for the East coast where people are like, People just live in covered wagons in Oregon. They maybe don't understand what Oregon is. So there's these good comparisons. Sorry, East Coasters. Uh, sorry. I mean, sorry, not sorry. I lived on the East Coast for a while and there was a lot of confusion about Oregon. You mean it's more than a trail? It is more than a trail. <laughs> more than a um, 1990s video game? Yeah, the best video game, by the way. So, okay, so this is another really, I think a useful article and also sort of this more details some of the damage and the spatial extent of the damage associated with the burned areas. And then finally, this is a National Geographic article about beavers and how sort of featuring some recent research that has come out in ecological applications, uh, a scholarly journal, but then also trying to emphasize that uh, kind of beaver dams and the ecology that beavers can sometimes curate, um, not intentionally, but more this is just what they do as a part of their ecology, can actually help to provide uh, these refuges for different types of plants, for animals, during burned events. So this is a wetland in Idaho post uh, up uh, after a burn, but you can see this kind of bright green area in the riverbed. Uh, and a lot of that is also fostered in, uh, by and stewarded by some of these, uh, these beavers. And so this article talks a bit about how that kind of the uh, larger ecosystem function that beavers can provide and how uh, kind of bringing back beavers to some of these habitats and uh, coming up with other ways to deal with the damage that beavers can cause. Cause beavers also cause some damage like flooding roads unintentionally and all these other things. So coming up with other ways to deal with beavers in particular could actually be sort of a win-win ecologically. Uh, and um, also for helping as we move forward into a drier climate, that's potentially could have more fire, that this might be one of the ways that we can sort of um, adapt. And so all of those articles will be in our notes um, on the, recorded show. Uh, but with that, that was fun being the correspondent. Yeah. Over to you, Pat. Maybe, that's right. Over. I am live in the field and I, <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, I'm in the same place I've been for the last six months. Um, okay. But let's, let's go ahead and bring Kit on. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Ready? Are you ready, Kit? Thumbs up. Yay. Yay or nay. Okay. Let's do it. Here you are. Ready. Boom. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Um, so before we get too far in, can you just give us um, an introduction of sort of who you are and uh, what your role is in the Forest Service? Yeah. And actually, uh, before I get too far into who I am now, I feel like I should probably tie into some of the fast facts that you guys introduced. Um, yeah, I think I, and if I said anything wrong, I, I apologize. Oh, I'm not, I'm not talking about correcting anything. I'm talking about making okay. direct connections to where you guys are coming from here. Um, okay. So yeah. a lot of people don't know this about me, but I was actually the entomology intern at the land at Epcot Center in 1999. I worked 
in insects for the mouse in Florida and Orlando for six months. That and is an amazing fun fact. That is an also amazing reared fun fact. monarchs among about 50 other species for the public to play with. Well, the public who pay 50 bucks a head to come inside the doors to play with. Um, yeah. In like and a butterfly so, tent? Yeah, yeah, we had butterfly tents. We had all sorts of cool things. Um, and yeah, we actually had like insect days at Epcot Center. Uh, and I was one of the junior entomologists. So, so were you, so, so I won't, I promise I won't hijack this whole thing to talk about monarch rearing, but were you totally like bamboozled by how much butterfly can fit into a chrysalis? I couldn't believe it. Like inside this tiny little thing unfolds this huge animal. Well, yeah, and we didn't, so butterflies especially because they have those huge wings, uh, but we also, you guys remember Silence of the Lambs, the death's head moth, the, it's a sphinx moth. It yeah. Can, it can hover in air. It's about the size of a small hummingbird. Right. Um, Terrifying. We reared those. They're also called tobacco hornworms or, or tobacco, yeah, they're, they're a hornworm moth. And okay. the caterpillar is huge. It's like the size of your middle so finger. Uh, wow. It's a giant green caterpillar that's about the, the width and, and uh, size of your middle finger. And they turn into basically a small hummingbird sized moth. Uh, so yeah, we reared those too. So yeah, pretty amazing animals. Wow. Yeah. I don't think I want to rear those. <laughs> that sort of like, looks like it sounds like to me, that sounds a little bit more like kind of like a nightmare hobby. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm scared of moths. So I'll admit that. But okay, that's so well, wild. Well, and, and I have moved past that. And I actually, <laughs> I've, I have always had a soft spot in my heart for, for insects and insect ecology and those types of things. Um, but what I found is as I've gotten, gone through my career, um, typically uh, some of the hardest hitting science that we've been able to do is in something called disturbance ecology. And disturbance ecology oftentimes involves insects. It's things like those giant bark beetle kills that you guys have been experiencing in Colorado quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also obviously wildfire, right? Wildfire is a, a natural process that is required uh, to basically shake up ecosystems and bring renewal at certain times. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunately the tie in to what you guys are experiencing right now. And it sounds like Micah might be um, at least watching from afar, hopefully. Hopefully from afar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and if you guys are interested and if you wanna get into some of the details of Cameron Peak uh, and also the Mullen fire that's burning a little further north, I could also do a share screen with you guys and show you some of the cool analytics that we've been providing for fires. Um, but they're all, yeah, that would they're be great. Cool, but they're also a little bit scary to kind of see, uh, based on the forecast you guys are, are expected to get today and tomorrow. Um, mm. we'll see what happens. Yeah. Right. Well, let's, but let's take a, let's take a quick step back and just give a sense of sort of what, what's your job? Where are you coming from? Are you here in Fort Collins or sort of kind of, uh, what's your role in the forest service? Maybe do that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, so I'm a research ecologist with uh, U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. And the research station itself, kind of our home base, is headquartered right at Fort Collins, right off campus from CSU where you guys are. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm not located there. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are. In fact, uh, about, about I'd say two thirds of the employees of RMRS are right there next to you guys on campus. I'm actually up here in Missoula. Ooh. And that's where one of the other big hubs of fire research, uh, specifically for the Forest Service. We have the fire lab out here, which is also part of Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, so I'm right on campus uh, at the University of Montana. Um, I actually haven't been to my office since April uh, because of the, the shutdowns. Uh, so I've been working uh, oftentimes overtime uh, for my home office, which is where I am right now. Uh, and my background uh, spans everything from insect ecology. I actually have a master's in forest insect ecology. Um, I did oh, wow. my PhD work at University of Arizona at the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research. So um, oh. I actually have a, a tree ring background uh, for disturbance ecology. And the way I got into fire was looking at kind of deep time understanding of disturbance on landscapes. Uh, basically you walk can into you, a forest. Can you define what you mean by deep time real quick? Yeah, so basically like you walk into a forest, you look around, um, you see some, some interesting things going on. Sometimes it's hard to explain exactly what, how the forest looks the way it does. And so what we do is we, uh, we sample the trees 
uh, to try and understand what has happened here over the last three, four, even 500 years. Uh, because every year the trees basically record every single thing that's happened to them. And then oh. they lock that record in a tree ring and then they build a new record on top of it. So uh, through a phenomenon of, of cross dating, you can actually find a, a dead piece of wood on the ground and then through pattern matching, figure out exactly where it fits in the chronology. And then once you can attach a year to each ring of growth, you can retell the story of what that tree experienced. So wait a second. So if how big of a piece of wood lying on the ground, like what's like the minimum size? I'm, I, you know what? I'm imagining like a big log, but could you do it with something smaller? You could. And the, the main thing is the number of records, the number of tree rings. Um, okay. In order okay. to get it like a statistically robust um, right. date in time, you've got to yeah. have a pattern that you can match to every other thing in time. And so you usually want to have yeah. at least 50 years, 50 rings okay. uh, of, uh, of data to match it. So you can really lock in and say, this is exactly where it fits in time. Oh, that's great. Um, and so doing that in Arizona, um, I one of the things I discovered during my work was uh, reconstructing the spatial and temporal components of fire. So how big fires got, how hot they got, where they yeah. burned um, over about 400 years. What we started to oh. notice was matching that with climate data. You could start to pick up the patterns of what's going to be a, a large fire year and what's going to be a small fire year. And, and what does that actually map out on the landscape? Mm. And one of the really cool things that we found was actually something that that relates to that last article you mentioned, Pat, about beavers uh, and this idea of what's called fire refugia. And so when you have a major fire year where you get this alignment of fuels down at the low elevations, the mid elevations and the upper elevations, you could see a fire spread from, say, a pinion juniper system at the bottom of the mountain up through the mixed conifer and all the way up to the spruce fir at the very top. Now that's very rare. That's something that, that at least historically happened at these several hundred year intervals, sometimes even a thousand years between times that that happened. Wow. But when that happened, there had to be some way for that system to regrow. Yeah, completely. And, yeah, and typically, um, because especially those high elevation systems, when they go, they go completely. Um, they, it, it's like 99% mortality, everything dies off. Right. But what tends to happen is in those high elevation areas, you have these little bog systems. You have these areas mm. with sphagnum moss that just builds up and you have these wet spots. And those little spruce that hang out in those wet spots can have a firestorm go over the top of them where everything around them is basically vaporized. And yet they survive. Yeah. Hmm. And then because but what, that, So what about the lower elevation spots? Well, so the lower elevation stuff typically doesn't burn as hot. Um, those low elevation okay. forests um, typically are much more fire adapted. Um, okay. They'll have a much higher survivorship. But the top okay. of the mountain, that's an area that when it burns, it burns really hot. Oh, interesting. Uh, and so okay. it, oftentimes it takes 100 or 150 years to recover. Whereas those low ele lower elevation systems can oftentimes uh, repopulate in a matter of decades. Uh, 5, okay. 10, 20, 30 years, something like that. Right, right. You, you said the beavers play into this? Well, Somehow? it's basically the idea of fire refugia, and uh, those fire refugia are formed where, where you have, wherever you create a moisture pocket on the landscape, mm. and that becomes a place that can't burn. And beavers are doing that in, in valleys um, at lower elevations, but uh, similar types of uh, formations happen at high elevation, too. Uh, and what we find is that year, year after year, or burnover after burnover in these patterns, we find that when regrowth starts to happen, you can actually track the age of trees coming out of those refugia. Hmm. The oldest trees are closest to the refugia after it's burned over. And then younger trees are spreading to the next location and then younger trees to the next location. So if you build uh, basically a recolonization of a landscape, it always comes back to those little refugia because that's where the seeds came from. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have my own questions to circle back to because I, I'm fighting my inner demons to nerd out right now. Um, and so, but if you have questions in the audience, please go ahead and post them in whatever. Um, if you're on YouTube or Periscope or wherever Facebook, just post them in there, and we'll see them here, and we can uh, try and get them to Kit. Um, in the meantime, uh, Micah, do you have some questions that you would like to ask? Or yeah. So. Um... As we, as we get into talking more about uh, your specific research in wildfire, 
Can you, I'm interested in hearing about how the management of wildfire has changed over the last 100 years or so, um, mainly because it's, it's changed quite a bit, right? Absolutely. Uh, and a lot of that has been culturally driven. Um, really, the, the culture of forest management in the United States uh, got its root, roots back in Germany. Um, the Yale School of Forestry, which is the oldest forest management institution or school in our country, um, is based on a German model that goes back to the middle of the 19th century. Hmm. And it's the idea of production level forestry, uh, basically forests as a crop that can be harvested at a certain number of, of year interval, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that you have to uh, be comfortable with if you're going to treat forest as a crop. Uh, first of all, you have to assume that conditions are never gonna change in that forest. You're not gonna have climatic variability. You're always going to have access to a good water source uh, and you're not going to have any disturbances that are going to mess up your crop over the 80 to 100 years it's going to take to grow a new crop. That seems kind of like wishful thinking. Yeah, it does. And um, back at the turn of the century, back around 1900, when uh, these ideas were kind of moving into American thought of how we could manage our natural resources, um, the birth of the Forest Service happened in 1908 under the original Roosevelt, 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 uh, uh, Roosevelt um, administration, Theodore. Mm -hmm. um, and his thought was basically to have um, a forest system that the country could use as its natural resource base, as its wealth um, going forward. And fire and any other disturbance threatened our, our bank account uh, of mm. forest basically. Uh, and so very early on, uh, there was this movement by foresters using the German model to keep fire out of forests. But interestingly, there, even at that time, there was a huge clash culturally because all the people who had been working in, in the natural systems of North America going back uh, 50 to 100 years, there was, there was kind of the European model and then the Native American model showed that North American forests are in fact designed to burn. Uh, the vast majority of North American forests are adapted to some level of fire interval, and some of them, actually a lot of them, benefit from frequent fire or the right kind of fire. Right. They need, so they need the it to be healthy. Absolutely. So as early as like 1910, people, there were actually scholars on both sides of this argument saying, we got to keep fire out of the national treasury of forests. And other people saying, if we don't start burning these things or keep burning these things, we're going to lose them to other other things are going to happen. Um, and the, the system is going to become unhealthy um, and eventually the system is going to explode. So interestingly, that, that debate goes way back um, hmm. and it, it kind of raged all the way through up into the 1920s. And then finally, by the mid 1920s and after World War I uh, and the advent of a lot of military technology and the idea that we could adapt that for use in the civilian land management core, um, then basically the Forest Service um, kind of gave up on the argument between the two sides and chose fire suppression as the best method for saving our forests. And that worked. Um, at least fire, that would be, fire suppression meaning not letting anything burn ever. If you can Exactly. Basically, e every fire is a bad fire. Um, gotcha. And so it, in the early 1930s, the 10, 10 a.m. policy came out. Um, that basically said that any fire that's detected should be out the next morning at 10 a.m. Hmm. Um, under at all costs. So send in the helicopter, send in any technology we had. In the 1930s, they didn't have helicopters, but they had airplanes by that time. They had a mm -hmm. lot of boots on the ground um, and they did have bulldozers and other things. And so the thought was um, get everything out as quickly as possible. Um, and interestingly, that that actually correlated with a climatic period from the 1940s all the way up to about the 1970s, where the Western United States was in this relatively cool, wet period of our climatology. And so uh, was not only was the policy to get fires out, but the, the conditions were right to put fires out. Um, hmm. And especially if you could catch a fire when it was small, when it was relatively easy to deal with, you could put it out with a shovel. Hmm. Um, and, and that's what people were doing. Um, so, go ahead. no, I just, how does, I mean, how does that now inform like an entire generation of people, not only 
were told this is the policy, but also learned and managed the forest in such a way that it worked, right? Like that's the way we've done it and it's worked. So why in the world would we question it? And I mean, that must have let, it must still be ricocheting through in terms of ma management within the forest service, right? Like in terms, there's like people that still think that or are there? Absolutely. And not so much in forest management. I think forest managers have wised up to how things are, but there is a, c a common public perception and that also um, trickles down into elected office and other things where people have a simplified view of how forest management should be done or could be done and what's possible and what's not. Um, interestingly, even during this period when the Forest Service was pretty much aligned with, with fire suppression, you, you guys have probably heard the name Aldo Leopold. Mm -hmm. um, Aldo Leopold is one of the most famous naturalists, and he's actually, uh, he, there's a whole center, a research center on wilderness that's named after him. And to the bitter end, he basically wrote essay after essay saying, this is never going to work. This, the, like, failure is coming um, by suppressing- In the sense fires. that fire is coming. Fire is coming, exactly. Okay. At some point, either the systems are going to fall apart because they haven't had fire, or if they catch fire, those fires are going to be unstoppable. Mm. And so and so, right now, more of the, the management consensus is some fire is good, some fire is necessary because it prevents, smaller fires prevent larger uncontrollable fires. Can you just like quickly explain, you know, it, it seems kind of like common sense, but quickly explain why, like, it reduces fuels and such and such. No, absolutely. So starting in the 1970s, um, the Forest Service started experimenting with something called like a prescribed fire and then also moving into what we called managed wildfire. Um, and we it, there was this general realization that the right fire in the right place under the right conditions can actually do a lot more good than harm. And that if we don't start punching small holes in this massive fuel scape, when we get a fire that does escape, because that happens every year, it will be impossible to control mm -hmm. um, until the weather changes. Uh, and that that's also when people finally started to recognize that no matter what you throw at a fire, under certain conditions, you cannot stop it until the conditions change on the ground. It, it's actually a weather phenomenon that drives fire. It's not our ability to drop retardant or anything else that stops fire oftentimes. Mm. Uh, and so it wasn't until about the 1980s that people really started to recognize exactly what you're talking about, Micah, which is this idea of, we call it a patchwork uh, forest, where we have multiple age classes, multiple age structures. Basically, we, we break up our landscape into a whole bunch of recently burned or burned 20 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever, um, which allows us to keep lots of different species. We, it takes care of the wildlife. It takes care of the ecosystem services, make sure that we're getting healthy, clean and water. We're storing carbon. But at the same time, when we get fires, um, those fires don't end up being massive fires. So that kind of theoretical approach got popular in the 1980s. And ever since, it's gained traction in terms of a theory. And it's been really, really hard to implement uh, mm. for a lot of reasons. Uh, because there are now people living in a lot of these areas, uh, because we are now dealing with climatic conditions that are not conducive to the right fire in the right, right time uh, for most of the year. Um, and so it's getting harder and harder to get these picture perfect fires burning um, where we want to. Uh, there's also been a lot of pushback from for things like smoke. You guys mentioned smoke is a huge issue, right? Uh, and the public got very used to, got very complacent with the idea of, of they don't have smoke. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Western Oregon, Western Washington for, didn't have a smoky summer. And then bam, 2018 took them completely by surprise. And then this year was even worse than 2018. And if you actually look at the newspaper articles uh, from Portland and Seattle going back to 1910 or the 1890s, smoke was a normal thing there until... Mm -hmm about the mm, 1930s. That's really interesting. Uh, and so culturally we've adapted to this, this picture perfect idea of very, very lush, dense forest. That's what a forest should look like. Uh, and it should never burn. And that's a completely unnatural manufactured state that we've created. Uh, another oh, thing that I, I, that I wanna touch on is there's a lot of discussion of, well, can we just cut our way out of this? Can we harvest our way out of this? One of the other reasons why we didn't have these big fires in the 40s, 50s, and 60s is because we did so much timber harvesting. 
Well, interestingly, especially in the Pacific Northwest and in the Northern Rockies where I am, there have been some really robust scientific studies that show that when you go in a new clear cut, you create a situation where you could have tenfold as many new trees coming in as you had before because nothing's getting wow. pruned down by fire. Fire selectively removes small trees and leaves big right. healthy trees behind. Logging oh. does the exact opposite. Hmm. Uh, logging Takes creates what we call dog hair. Yeah, it, it, it creates what we call dog hair thickets where basically a single match um, at ground level could burn a tree all the way to the top because you have tree against tree, uh, completely right. close canopy. And so mm. unless you're willing to go in and thin that stand four or five times, which is not economically viable, you're creating a much worse condition than if it had burned. Hmm. You said something earlier about how the idea of having like the right fire at the right time is actually very hard to implement because now we have houses in the mountain and people live everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that made me think about, I had looked up one of a recent paper that you were an author on. Um, this was the one, the, let's see if I can find it. The wildfire risk science facilitates adaptation of fire prone social ecological systems. Yes. And there was a, just a line in there that it said, there's increasing consensus that human communities, land managers and fire managers need to adapt and learn to live with fires. Um, however, for a variety of different things, uh, ecological factors, existing science-based management strategies, and like humans, um, it's it's not that is not sufficient to address the problem as both a problem and a solution because, like, we're kind of in a catch twenty two is what it feels like. Absolutely, um, and and I think uh, I think we talk about the fire paradox a little bit in that basically this idea that. Um, as fires get bigger, we, there's more public outcry to stop fires from burning as we successfully stop certain fires from burning. Uh, we actually create more of a fuel buildup, which means that when f conditions get bad, we end up with bigger fires again. And so we're, we're in this, this loop that we're, we're stuck in. Uh, but one of the things that also comes out of that paper is a lot of people know or this kind of general idea that fires know no boundaries, right? Fires don't Ooh. care who owns the land. Fires just burn. It's just a phys physiological they don't process. Stop it. It's, state lines. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's a physics. Uh, it's it's just a a physics uh, and and chemistry reaction that's going on. Um. And so interestingly, interestingly, one of the things that we've really tried to push for is that while fires don't know boundaries, neither do fire control locations. And so uh, one of the big pushes of that paper was to start looking at the science of how fire is likely to behave on any given landscape. And then imagine those ownership boundaries don't exist. And instead we're talking about bringing in federal ownership, state ownership, local municipalities to basically look at an analytical tool that tells us what fire is likely to do here. And then what is the best strategy to make sure that we do get the right kind of fire in the right places to do good work but then also, if we do have values out there, if we have people out on the landscape, where are the places to, to take a stand to make sure that we don't lose homes and we don't burn over people? Mm. Um, and, and they're really very different goals, but they align beautifully, actually. If you can identify areas where you really need to concentrate on suppression, great. That's usually less than 5% of the landscape. Mm. And if you can identify large swaths of the landscape where you could potentially restore fire to some kind of a natural state where you could reduce the risk of future fires, um, that is ideal. Um, unfortunately, this is not the year to do that uh, with COVID-19. Uh, but right. last year uh, and for the last five or six years, we've been really pushing forward with this framework of in the preseason, trying to separate those two extremes and basically everything in between too. Like where are the areas that are ripe for restoration under the right conditions, but also may require suppression under the wrong conditions. Okay, so just to that end, um, we have a question. Bring it on, Randall Barnes. What fraction of the national forests in the U.S. Um, are currently being managed using our best understanding of the science? So sort of what you were just talking about, you do this effort in the preseason, uh, an evaluation of like these are places that we, you know, got to protect. These are places that really we should start to bring under this more kind of natural fire regime. Can you, do you have a sense of, that, that in terms of the fraction of the forest that's being managed in such a way that's uh, using the best available understanding of what we ought to be doing? 
Yeah, and and I will say first of all, this is not a one size fits all approach. Um, sure. And the Forest yeah. Service. Uh, what's what's another unique thing about the Forest Service is we have our own research branch, and we always have. Um, and so science has been used to inform forest management now for almost a hundred years. Um, wow. So I would technically say that all <laughs> national forest system is being managed under a scientific basis. Um, That's a safe answer. It, it, well, it, it's true though. I mean, sci science is <laughs> no fair. I get it. No, I understand every aspect of forest management in one way or another, but in terms yeah. of, of fire response specifically, um, right. So our group uh, has has directly engaged with more than 40 national forests in the Western United States. Um, just for a, a reference point, I think there are 183 national forests in the country. Um, two thirds of those are west of the Mississippi. Um, yeah, okay. And I would say of the national forests that get large fires, um, we are now involved uh, with working with probably more than two thirds of them on this specific process. Um, that's not to say that this process, that our process is the only process. Um, yeah, sure. Every yeah. national forest system is doing uh, a lot of pre-gaming about what does fire look like. Um, every, every group of leaders within every national forest is reaching out to uh, their, their community partners to, to do scenario planning, those types of things. That's not a new invention. This is something that's been going yeah. on for 50 years. Right. Uh, but this kind of formalized process of bringing people together with a specific set of analytics in the preseason to assess right. those analytics and actually start to use uh, basically completely objective views of what fire is likely to do. Um, so far, it's only been limited by our ability to uh, produce these these tools. Um, and one of the wow. challenges that we've run into is there's, there's really only three of us who do this. Jeez. Um, and so... Um, <laughs> During the, uh, the, the last three years, uh, we have actually, yeah, we, we've now engaged 40 national forests in this planning system. Holy cow. Uh, but over the last three months, the three of us have also provided these analytical tools to 57 wildfires in the Western United States. Jeez. Um, so, and, and I'm a researcher, I'm not a production analyst. Um, and so what this does is it takes me away from doing new research by just applying right. these tools. Um, so this technically yeah. isn't my job, um, but I find it extremely important. And so I, I spend my time on it right now. Uh, right. But we are looking for ways to, to yeah. transition this over. Um, so I would say, uh, for example, in Region 2, where you guys are in Colorado, um, the entire Colorado National Forest System is moving in this direction. Um, all of Arizona and New Mexico has already adopted this. Wow, okay. uh, California is just starting to take this on because Cal Fire has had its own uh, kind of method for doing a lot of this work. Uh, but now they started to recognize some of the value here. And then the entire states of Oregon and Washington um, are now adopting these practices. I mean, that seems like not the lion's share, but a lion's share of the fires that are taking place in terms of when we think about the places that are going to be most susceptible that are uh, seem to be burning more um, I guess on that note, and sorry, Mike, I know you have a bunch of questions, but I, I just, okay. On that, on that question of where fires are burning and how frequently in the news, we often see these headlines of, you know, fires are happening more frequently. They're burning more area. This article that I just showed at the beginning actually had some, some numbers, some statistics about that from the forest service perspective, or even just from your perspective, is that actually the reality that you're seeing? Are we seeing more fires? Are they burning larger areas? Is that something that is a robust kind of phenomena now? Or is this just because we're paying attention or it's the summer and it's hot and we're seeing a lot of fires, so we're thinking that, and then as soon as it gets to be snowy again, we stop paying attention. I kind of, I, I guess I'm trying, to, I'm trying to separate, take a step back and think, you know, this is what the media is saying. Uh, but I want to make sure that my perception actually matches reality in that sense. Yeah. And actually, uh, there has been some really good research on this. And uh, so there have been a number of studies over the last five years that have specifically looked at fire size and fire severity um, as um, patterns over the last five years. Um, the first thing I will tell you is I have uh, a colleague from Oregon State University uh, over in Corvallis. And his brother-in-law's house burned over in Talon, Oregon, about three weeks ago. Um, he has another friend who lived in Phoenix who also lost a house. 
Um, so he is like very personally involved with the fire ecology of this system. And interestingly, he just he just wrote an op-ed um, that is being shopped out to the New York Times right now. And the general thought is in systems that are really wet, uh, like, say, the, the Western Cascades of Oregon and Washington, the presumed fire return interval in that system was probably 110 to 150 years. So it's a when you say was, how long ago? Uh, so the last time that that or so typically what that means is uh, any given location, any given forest, right. in a, a cho choose your area, uh, right. wouldn't burn more frequently than every 100 to 150 years. OK, um, which is why when we look at these huge fires that are happening right now in Western Oregon, um, you can't really say that we're outside of that because I these see. are areas that have not burned in at least 80, many 100 years. Um, okay. And so that's an, an area that's gotten very used to not having fire. Um, and right. so things like the wildland urban interface where people are building all over the place, they felt very safe doing that because these, are, these were thought of as asbestos forests. These were systems that wow. just didn't burn. Um, now we won't know for another rotation whether we're out of that 100 to 150 year loop or not. Um, if these things burn again in 20 years, then yeah, that's a flag. That's a problem. We need to think about that. I mean, um, what if they burn? What if they burn twice in the next 10? Yeah, exactly. So what what okay. that would do is that would that would tell us that we are getting out of any kind of a natural system that we we are used okay. to. Um, now, if you if you move to the other side of the mountains, uh, if you, you look at say the the eastern side of the Cascades that are much drier right. forest. Um, those are forest types that typically did burn more frequently in the past, and we are absolutely seeing more fire more frequently, burning hotter uh, than anything we've seen in the last 150 years. Wow. Okay. Uh, because we've seen enough fire rotations, and we've actually, we uh, there's a, a paper that recently came out um, in ecological applications that basically showed that these things are burning so fast and so hot that they're not coming back as forests anymore. Exactly. Um, there are significant parts of the landscape now that are converting to shrublands or even to grasslands. Uh, and that's a phenomenon that hasn't hit the West Coast yet. But I'm not saying mm. it won't, unfortunately. Uh, well, that's I mean, so on that note of like tipping points in the systems, I mean, to, well, to bring those two points together that you were just talking about. Where you think about the return interval of, I mean, this is true of floods too, right? We think of like the return return period of certain kinds of floods or design storms, et cetera, for designing stormwater infrastructure, for example. In terms of designing a forest ecology, which in some ways the Forest Service is sort of designing this ecology or they're planning and trying to manage it in such a way that's sort of helping with that. Um, when you think about a return period, it's taken over some period of time, right? So you have a hundred years of data, you use, you do your statistics, you calculate the return period of say, a return frequency of like a certain kind of storm or a, or a fire event. But if we're in a changing domain and we're no longer stationary in terms of the climate, let's say, then um, how much anticipation comes into this in terms of uh, if we know the system is tipped or is tipping on the Eastern side of the Cascades in the West Coast, for example, um, but it hasn't tipped yet on the West side, how much can we say, well, anticipate that change because it's happening. All these other signals are pointing to climate change happening. It's not like we're slowing down our carbon emissions, all this stuff. Is there a space in the Forest Service's kind of remit to anticipate these changes and say, look, we, we can't say with certainty that this is happening right now, but everything says it will in the next you know, 15 or 20 years or whatever. Um, is there space in your job to anticipate that? Or is that really something where you have to be reactive? No, absolutely. Uh, you can anticipate that. And that's, that's not a new exercise. Um, so there's something called state and transition modeling that the Forest Service and, and all land managing agencies have been using um, for 10 year and 20 year and 30 year planning horizons. Oh, great. And they were developed originally with just this idea of uh, basically just a, a forest moving from recently burned to recovery. And now we're starting to recognize, uh, and I wouldn't say it's a new thing, it's the last 20 years, we've started to recognize there are these, these jump off points where if you mm. burn a system 
or disturb a system. It doesn't have to necessarily be fire. It could be insects, could be um, over logging too. Once you hit a system hard enough with enough disturbances, you can actually kind of have an off ramp where it no longer comes back to the system it was going to be. Now you're on a new trajectory. Um, and so that, that type of actual landscape modeling using computers um, to, to project um, what's going to happen um, has been going on now for about 20 years. It's gotten a lot more sophisticated recently. Um, and it's also been informed by, with a lot of collaborations with universities and, and other research groups. Um, so we had a paper actually that I was first author on that came out uh, the middle of this year um, that specifically did just that. Um, it looked at 50 years of projected climate um, and 16 species that all interact to form an ecosystem um, in, a, in a mountain range in Arizona. And what we basically found was certain species just start to drop out as the fire frequency and the, the climatic conditions change. And you do see these wholesale conversions happening, but it's not gradual. It's, it's like a tipping point happens and then it just doesn't come back anymore. Well, we are over time. Um, so maybe so we don't um, end on that note. First of all, is there anything that you wanted to touch on that we didn't ask you about? Um, so I did want to actually just give a, you guys are probably already getting this in the news. Uh, I did just kind of want to warn people about something. It's not great news, but uh, you are expecting red flag conditions today and tomorrow, uh, both on um, the, let's see here, the Cameron Peak fire and the Mullen fire burning to the north. Um, and so there is some concern that Red Feather Lakes um, up just northeast of the kind of the upper thumb of Cameron Peak uh, could right. be under threat. Uh, and then uh, there's definitely some concern. Uh, the Mullen fire right now is actively growing eastward. Um, and so uh, basically anything that's east of the, the Mullen fire footprint right now is something of concern. Uh, we've developed the analytics for those fires and show there's not a lot of control opportunities until they see a change in veg type. Uh, when they move out of that heavy timber, they'll have a chance to get their arms around it. But mm. until that happens, um, there's not a whole lot other than some roads they could potentially use. So I, I want to just put that wow. out there as kind of a public service announcement. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Is there do you have a is there a specific place where people should go to get updates about these local yeah, fires? So there's some really cool tools, and maybe I should give you those as links. But first of yeah. all, I would ask you uh, to have your audience Google Fire Data and Google Earth. Uh, it's okay. a publicly available website. Um, it immediately comes up with something called the the MODIS fire detections. Um, and uh, basically detector that tells you uh, basically the last 12 hours of fire spread. Turn that one off because it's not very good. Uh, and okay. turn on VIRS. Uh, it's the third option down, V-I-I-R-S. It's much higher resolution and it's updated more frequently. And it'll actually get you down to like, what's the neighborhood or what's hopefully not neighborhood, but what's like the, the quadrant next to a lake or whatever that's currently burning right now. Where's the heat and where's, where are things cooling off? Mm. Um, and then the other thing, if people want updates, um, the, it's called the NIFSI IMSR. So it's the incident management, something or other, I can't remember exactly what it is, but if you, if you look up NIFC space IMSR on Google, um, it'll give you the daily fire management rap sheet for what's going on around the country. Okay. Uh, I noticed today that Cameron peak is now 27% contained. That means they're pretty sure that 27% of this fire is not going to spread. Um, but if you look at the heat image on Cameron Peak, I'd say it's like 85% of that fire is, is not of concern anymore. Mm. Uh, the only area of concern with Cameron Peak at this point is really that northern area. Well, I shouldn't say the only. Huh? There's still a couple of hot spots. Um, but you can see those in fire data in Google Earth. Cool. Um, and with the high winds, and warm temperatures you guys are expecting this weekend, uh, those areas are the areas that are gonna flare up. If, they, if they're showing a heat signature now uh, and they get a chance to move, they, they may. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Yeah. Um, and these are, what's cool about this is these are data that are available to everybody all the time if you know about them. And so if you're ever in an area and you're concerned about well, where's that smoke coming from, turn on fire data, data in Google Earth, uh, pull up, the NIFSI IMSR, and you'll get a nice update of what's actually going on uh, for fire management. Cool. Um, okay. I didn't get a chance to talk about the, the rosy side of things, which is how we plan for these. 
how we use something called pods to get land managers together to look at analytics and actually just start planning for the right fire at the right time. Um, I will tell you right now that the uh, Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest is working through their pods planning right now. So oh, that fires like Cameron Peak in the future, um, while there's still going to be emergency events, uh, they're going to be uh, super organized in knowing what they can, what you can expect out of these fires. Um, yeah. And they are being very progressive in planning on which part of the landscape they'd like to see more fire and which part of the landscape they're planning to keep fire out of and how they're going to do it. Cool. So uh, you actually are living in a very good place for forest planning and science right now. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah, you'd sent us a link to uh, a story map, which is like a neat kind of animated website about the pods. Um, and we'll put that in the note section of this so people can take a look at it. Okay, great. I'm How really bummed wanna... that we're out of time. I know, this one was so I have interesting. so many more questions to ask. Pat, do you want to uh, ask our final question? Yeah, so our final question that we ask everybody that's on the show is, what's something, doesn't have to be related, in fact, it's probably not related to Forest <laughs> Fire, but what's something that's positive that's happened during this crazy virtual COVID pandemic time Post for lockdown, you? Post lockdown, new normal. Post like, so something like we started in whatever, February or March, this kind of crazy lockdown time. It doesn't have to be work related, it can be life related, anything that's like just a happy thing that's happened for you, anything. Hopefully one happy thing has yeah, happened so for actually, you. Yeah, uh, so actually, so Pat, you're a dad and maybe you've experienced this too. Um, so our daughter is gonna be three uh, next month. Yeah. And uh, she is back in daycare right now. We don't know how long that's gonna last because uh, COVID cases are on the climb, unfortunately, here in Montana. Uh, oh, but one here. thing that's, that I've noticed over the last six months is my blood pressure has dropped dramatically because I spend so much more time with my daughter. And I think my patience is so much better than it used to be. <laughs> Um, and so that's like, that's me, not the case for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For, for me, it's been like a bonding thing. Uh, oh, yeah. like, like family has just, uh, I think really helped recenter me, uh, in mm. terms of health wise. I'm still overworked. I'm still have a career that's very demanding. Uh, but I, I would say that, um, this has given me a chance to catch my breath and think about what's important. And, yeah. uh, I think, that is one silver lining to the situation we're in right now. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Kit. Um, this was a really interesting conversation. And yeah, um, outstanding. Yeah. Well, great. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, if absolutely. you uh, if you have more questions, send people my way. Um, yeah, let, let me know what I can share and I'll uh, happy to contribute any way I can. Awesome. Yeah, and maybe and maybe we can try and coax you onto a future show, maybe a pre-season show, a pre-fire season show, and we can talk about some of these other things that we didn't get time to talk about. Absolutely. I think uh, there, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, the science is going into land management, not so much this right. reactive fire exactly. response right now. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, thank you. Kit. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So, All right. I'm really bummed. I had so many more questions. I know, ask. but we've been on here for 58 minutes. And I know, I, I know. You're doing, you're doing the right thing, Mike. I'm doing, doing my right. job. You're doing your job. Okay, so... Brief, we, brief SOGES announcements. Brief SOGES announcements. October 6th, we've got another great virtual lecture happening with Thomas Beats. Oh, yeah. um, Who's that? He is a, an external, or an, yeah, an external advisory board member of SOGES, and he is a University Distinguished Professor at Mi Michigan, I think. I'm not, I, <laughs> I, I actually, I know who he is, but I was just, for our, for our audience, I thought they should know. Yes, Environmental Science and Policy Animal Studies at Michigan State University. Yeah, that should be a good um, So one. it's going to be a really good one. It's about sustainability solutions, emphasis on the plural. Um, so that's going to be Tuesday, October 6th. Go to our website, sustainability.colostate.edu and um, register for the Zoom link. And that's all I'll say, I'll say about that. Okay, hold on a second. We got to thank you again, folks. Look at that. Uh, thank thanks, you. Randall. Thank you for showing up. Uh, let's Love see. It. Love it. So the other thing I wanted to say is we just had um, a seminar, a SOGIS -Sogis seminar uh, by Mary Hill, who is a visiting fellow at SOGIS for this academic year. And it was on uh, futures, so food, energy, water, futures. Um, 
And I think that's, is that live now on the website, on the YouTube channel? If it's not currently, it will be very soon. It will be soon. So check that out. And she's going to be a guest on Sustainability Happy Hour, I think, not next time, but the time after that. Yep. Um, and stay tuned for the next guest that we'll be having in two weeks. We're waiting on a confirmation. So we want to hold off on the announcement, uh, but we will hopefully have that shortly. All right. Okay. Well, Thanks, everybody. Happy Friday, Pat. Happy, happy Friday, Friday to, you, Micah. to our audience. And thanks for tuning in. Yep. Bye. Bye.